Yeah. The intro. So, great to uh, to see you here, Anneke. Welcome. And uh, great to uh, the people are coming online now. And yeah, we're just starting. And um, welcome, everybody. Welcome again in the part two of this um, uh, webinar series with Anneke Lucas and myself about safety, permission, and boundaries. I think a very important subject. Um, as we, uh, most of us are working with people and uh, with human connections, I think it's a very important subject. And, and of course, because we're humans ourselves. And um, so a few, um, a few points uh, to begin with. This uh, webinar will be recorded. So uh, if you cannot join the whole webinar or uh, if you are not here now, then uh, some people are not here who signed up. They will get a recording in their uh, email box. Everybody gets the recording. If you have a question to us, please use the chat function. If you look down, you see this little chat. If you click on it, then on the right side, you see the chat and you can just um, put your questions there. Um, other things, well, this webinar will take one hour and please feel free to ask us everything that you want to ask us. This is a really great opportunity uh, to connect with us in a live way. So use that opportunity. And we also really like to connect with you and uh, get to know you a little bit better. So we would really love it um, if you could introduce yourself. So maybe just typing uh, where you're from and maybe also what is your, uh, your job title or what is your function or your profession. Um, because we are talking this time uh, a little bit more about safety permission and boundaries in the work situation. So for us, it's, um, it's, uh, it's good to know also who is here and what is your work situation. So please type this in the chat. And also the questions, we will make some time uh, now and then to, to check the questions and, uh, and, uh, and answer them as we go. So um, again, welcome to Anneke Lucas from New York. Could you introduce yourself to start? Yeah. Sure. Um, so my name is Anneke Lucas. I am the founder of Liberation Prison Yoga. I also act as um, executive director there. I am an advocate for um, survivors and um, survivors of child sexual abuse and survivors of uh, sex trafficking, child sex trafficking. Uh, I myself am a survivor. And um, I should say that recently I've been speaking about and working with people who have experienced um, satanic ritual abuse. So this is a whole other... Um, level and layer of abuse and I've had the privilege to spend most of my life healing from that and I've created a healing modality called the unconditional model that is being implemented in trainings and um, around the world. Annika and I are going to be doing a training in which we're going to be working with the unconditional model and I'm also writing a book about that. Thank you. Great. So um, this is Anneke Lucas, and then I am also an Anneke. <laughs> My name is Anneke Sips, and I'm from the Netherlands. I'm a psychiatric nurse. I'm working in psychiatry since 20 years. Also, I'm a yoga teacher, yoga therapist, and um, I'm bringing the worlds, uh, those worlds together. And um, I'm especially um, focused on working with trauma uh, through these professions, actually. And also psychosis or psychotic disorders like schizophrenia um, because I've been uh, for me it's um, uh, it, it's it's a it's a group of people I've been working with a lot and um, I also find it it's very difficult to see how how much stigma there is on mental health in general but also on this this particular group of people I think there's a lot of stigma and I see that a lot of uh, the people I've worked with, they felt very unseen and unheard and very um, unhappy because of that. And yeah, I, I, I kind of um, feel sometimes the same way or I felt in my life sometimes the same way. So I can resonate with this feeling. 
sometimes it, it came from from a different kind of source but I know how it is to to feel not seen or not here because of my own experiences in my past and I am um, yeah I, I I'm very happy that I can now bring these this this work together and um, and work with 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 people who feel like this and maybe help them to um, to develop their own voice so they can um, well they can speak and they can feel and be heard again and I think this is very important to um, um, yeah to, to to know that even if you don't feel like you're here or you cannot ha find your own voice to know that it's possible to learn that so this is something that I'm very interested in, uh, in and and in my uh, in my yoga work and in my yoga therapy work I, uh, I created this uh, this this training and this model about compassion based hatha yoga where uh, we try to um, be our own therapist so instead of um, being in therapy with, uh, with somebody else, being in therapy with yourself. So this is something I'm developing. So, and well, together, like Annika said, we are, uh, we are gonna do a training that brings our work together. So it's a really interesting dynamic, I think. And today we like to, um, well, to, to connect with you and to talk with you about subjects of safety, permission and boundaries. Um, and uh, well, let's, Let's start with a question, Annika. How John, John has already asked the question. Um, John has written, I'm a freelance writer and consultant. We'll be having more in-person meetings. So as a survivor of childhood sexual abuse, I want to learn how to take care of myself and be appropriate with others. So thank you, John, for posing that question. And I will start by speaking to that, Annika, and then maybe you can um, add to it. Um, uh, John, I've struggled with... Um, uh, especially with uh, feeling worthy of my being paid um, appropriately for my services. And that also often extends into personal time. So I give a certain uh, set amount of time to a client or a person, and then uh, usually the boundaries get pushed and they, that, that client will want more time. So I've worked, um, I've had to do a lot of work uh, around, um, around that, around setting boundaries to take care of myself. And that uh, usually includes by starting the conversation or the time, the meeting, the in-person meeting with a um, clear, clear uh, time when we will be ending that meeting so that that person knows in advance. And then uh, before uh, the meeting ends, about five mi minutes before the meeting ends, I'll usually say we have only about five minutes. And then I personally, I should say that I often go over still and I'm still, this is a work in progress. Now, I don't know if this is the same kind of meetings that you'll be having because you'll be a consultant and a writer. Um, so um, as a writer too, it's obviously not easy to get paid for uh, writing work. Um, I've usually just taken what I, whatever I could get. I've sometimes declined to write um, for certain venues because they were not paying. And, and uh, this is very interesting because obviously writing is um, very valuable and our, our work and our time is valuable. And so how do we measure, how do we balance um, being seen as a writer and at the same time also uh, getting paid for yeah, getting getting paid a, a decent salary for what we do um, to be appropriate with others I should say um, that it seems to be a question of someone who is so concerned with that 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 in itself tells me that you probably are a lot more appropriate than you think um, I spent most of my life in a guilt complex always worrying that I had uh, done something wrong, which was a direct result of childhood abuse in which I was being made to feel that I somehow deserved that abuse. So there must be something wrong with me. There must, I must be bad. And those messages were so uh, strong in my adult life that I constantly wondered if I was appropriate. And I can't say that I always was, but at the same time, I was so concerned about it that most of the time, it was my 
my own worry, my worry about it itself was the problem and not so much my behavior. I hope that this is a little bit helpful. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, Annika. And I would like to uh, to add a little bit to this. Um, it's already very nice that you uh, ask yourself that question, right? This is uh, what, what I also hear Annika say. Um, and um, I think it's, it's, it's good to, uh, to really uh, like tune in with yourself before you start. This is what I always like to do when I'm seeing, because I, I see a lot of one-on-one uh, -on -one clients. This is um, mostly what I do at the moment. And I always like to tune in with myself before people are coming in, like, okay, how am I doing? Where am I in a rush? Am I feeling not so, not so good within myself? Did I have uh, just a not so nice conversation with a colleague or what, what happened? And okay, first center myself and finding my, my personal entunement and connect to myself in the moment. And then um, that, that for me makes, makes, makes a, a really big difference. And, um, and taking care of yourself, like really first start with your own boundaries. Like what is your own boundary? Where's your, when do you feel safe? and learning how do you feel this? When do you feel when people are over your boundaries? How do you re react to this? Um, like what are the first small signals, things like that, so that you can notice kind of fast, like, oh, wait. <laughs> and maybe even if you don't really know what to do, but at least you notice, okay, some, this, there's a boundary. There's a signal here. Yeah, so. Thank you for your question, John. I hope that um, that it helps, that it that it makes that it makes sense to you, what we are um, what we are saying. Um, yeah, this this is actually uh, just to to continue a little bit on this subject. Maybe uh, to work one on one with a person and how it works with boundaries, um, because I'm doing yoga therapy, obviously with with a person means it's kind of also. Um, because I like to like to make the feeling like equal, like I'm an equal of the other person. We're both bare feet. We're sitting on the ground on a yoga mat, and it's really kind of a vulnerable, vulnerable place also to be. And um, and I also want to allow myself to be in this vulnerable place. But I also noticed that I couldn't do this uh, since the beginning. I had to develop this, and I had to learn this, and I'm still learning and developing. So for me, it's very important to constantly check in with myself and feel my signals and also reflect on that with myself and also sometimes with other people um, to see uh, how, yeah, how, how, am I, how am I in this, uh, in, in this kind of um, work. And um, so this is in a one-on-one in, in one -on -one setting. And in a group setting, it has a very different dynamic, but it's, it's also an... Um, um, yeah, very good to, to check in with yourself um, very often, like how am I doing and how are my boundaries, how do I feel at the moment and return to that before, um, like for, for example, step into the room or start a session. How do you feel about this, uh, Annika? Like do you, if you work one-on-one -on -one or if you have a conversation one-on-one -on -one, um, or maybe an interview, like in any kind of dynamic that is a uh, one-on-one, -on -one, Yes, well, when a, when and it's interesting. It's interesting you say interview because when you have interview, usually I'm thinking interview for a job or something where there is someone who is in some superior position, who has some, you know, I may be giving that person some power, which would be the harder version of um, my own um, boundaries and whatever uh, nervousness may come up. So um, I find it really important to what exactly what you said to remain mindful of my own reactions of my internal reactions so checking my internal reactions so that i know where i am at any given moment and i know what my internal landscape looks like before i respond or before i say something um i haven't been in a situation like that in a long time but i think it's uh, worthy to mention and i see that here's a behavioral health worker occupational therapy mental health yoga uh medical missions so there are people who are mostly working in the health and wellness um industry here and then a writer consultant 
and uh, but for example yeah. Anneke, like uh, like in an interview i'm kind of curious actually because this this sometimes people uh, recently or the last years people are more and more interviewing you about your uh, story and what what i also see i don't know if i can um, uh, if if this makes sense but as a healthcare professional, because next, besides being a yoga therapist, I'm also a nurse. I did a lot of interviewing with, with clients and yeah. I'm asking them everything. I'm asking the most personal questions. Mm -hmm. I'm asking the people about their sex life. I'm asking them about their sleep habits. I'm like, it's, as a nurse, you do this. And it's, it's kind of, um, um, yeah, what happens if you get into a hospital? And, but it's, it's really, uh, uh, um, important, I think, to keep thinking about where is boundaries and how do people react to this. How do you feel being interviewed um, by another yeah, person? I, for whatever reason, I have a very easy time to separate what is professional yet extremely personal. So mm -hmm. I speak about things, and it's kind of my work to speak about things that are extremely personal, and yet it it doesn't feel so personal to me. So I, um, I may share about my story, my history, and I've shared this many times in public, so it doesn't feel, I don't feel as vulnerable. And also, let's say that is a kind of vulnerability that I've gotten used to because I've done it so many times. So I'm not as vulnerable when I share what has happened to me, for example, um, even though for someone else who hasn't shared these things before, especially publicly to strangers, that may be may seem like the 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 the, the greatest um, you know there, there may be a lot of shame around it, and it may be extremely difficult to share these things. Whereas uh, for me, it doesn't feel quite the same. But something personal would be something that I consider to be part of my personal life that is not part of my story that may make me a lot more vulnerable to share it but because i have this habit of sharing publicly i tend to recognize the fear and uh, potential obstacle before sharing and then do it anyway and on the what 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 that what happens from that though is that you as a nurse had a lot of people sharing you know revealing extremely mm -hmm. personal things to you because it was part of your work with me, because my story is of such a personal nature, a lot of people come to me from all over the world sharing extremely deeply personal stories. And I often get um, uh, messages that are this long, you know, mm -hmm. that, are, that are huge, huge long emails, and I may just not even have the time to read it. Um, and... And, and sometimes it's also a, a, of a nature that, that I'm being asked to give advice or something that I can only respond that this would be, would take too much of my time to respond to privately, that I, I just can't do that. I can offer a professional consultation, but I cannot respond to this privately because that is, that's going to be taking too much of my time. Mm -hmm. And then I still end up doing that quite a, quite a bit anyway. You know, if the message is not this long, but it's this long, I'll still probably at some point get to it and then maybe respond, uh, you know, however sensitively to, to it. Um, so I just want to note that uh, Megan has uh, mentioned that she practices yoga um, working with a yoga therapist and is soul searching about teaching yoga to others. So um, I just spent, um, so Annika and I are going to be doing this workshop together, which also has yoga in it. And then I just spent a weekend working with uh, people mostly who teach yoga uh, to train them to come into the prisons with us. So um, Megan, what was, what's really interesting is that people are taught to teach yoga in a certain way that is extremely vertical. Um, or you could say militaristic, or you could say that it fits into the spiritual industrial complex where um, uh, it's really a capitalist system 
and you're asked to throw commands out at people and get them to do what you want them to do and take control as the yoga teacher. And so our training undoes a lot of that. And in that undoing, it asks yoga teachers to look at themselves um, and do the same mindfulness work that Annika and I do on ourselves regularly to make sure that you're not unconsciously needing to um, to be in a position of power over other people that you don't because of whatever trauma unresolved trauma you may have you may need that boost that ego boost of having people look up to you um, in yoga which I believe creates an unhealthy um, system and an unhealthy uh, power dynamic that um, is ultimately not limiting the benefit of yoga. So um, in searching to be a yoga teacher, I would say find uh, perhaps a teacher training that already focuses on trauma yoga. Um, and that when you go into trauma yoga, I can share with you, for example, uh, Oh, thank you, Andrea. So Andrea is sharing that she took the Liberation Prison Yoga before the 200-hour training. And you're absolutely welcome to do that too, if that's possible, because it's true that it helped her with the 200-hour training. Um, because yes, it, once you get to teach in a trauma-informed way, you really can't go back. It becomes second nature. And the uh, way that is generally taught is just becomes so awkward and weird. Um, mm -hmm. And then at the same time, when you teach uh, from that place of equality, really, that we are souls and the first thing that we do is connect, the issue of safety, boundaries, and permission immediately comes up and becomes extremely potent because you are now, um, you are still in a position of power. You are still in an, an authority, a place of authority, even though you may... Um, not act that way you may not be attached to the status of that position and um, people will be the point is to connect the first order of our business is not to teach yoga is not to do anything together but it's to connect make a human connection with a person and that requires for us to be extremely present doing the work on ourselves so that we, we can be aware and um, to um, um, make sure that that um, that we are clear about our own boundaries. That's to say, my boundaries are mostly dictated from my healing and self-esteem. Mm -hmm. That creates a sense in me that something, like you were saying, Annika, before something has been crossed, some something something is happening, and I'm not feeling. Um, all right with it and to immediately know that that is fine there is nothing wrong with feeling that someone steps on your on your uh, um, has crossed the boundary that doesn't feel comfortable I used to uh, um, from the guilt from the place of guilt always think oh well I shouldn't think that there's something wrong about saying no you know I shouldn't like you know, I'm gonna be I'm gonna be perceived as a bad person if I if if I uh, feel that this person who's such a nice person is doing something that's making me feel icky. So that was my boundary. Uh, that's how I have learned to uh, trust my intuitive sense about boundaries being crossed and to um, to be to learn to be firm and yet kind about it. And I think what I, uh, if I can add something, um, like like I said also in the beginning, I'm 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 on in this project of be your own therapist, and it really starts from yourself and your own practice first. I think also a yoga teacher training, it's all about your own practice in yoga or in life, like your own personal development in. Uh, and in whatever way and whatever dimension and whatever perspective but really finding finding ways that you recognize your own triggers that you recognize your own patterns and that you learn how to find your own safe space wherever you are 
so that in this safe space you can be your authentic self and if you want to connect with another person if it's like a like a yoga teacher yoga therapist or or any other profession um, it always starts with finding a connection within yourself first and feeling that you can that there's space that you have the permission also to be yourself and um, and sometimes you need to ask for this and you need to just like like you need to uh, cre create this place where you can be yourself and um, yeah I think that's that that is really important that then otherwise also it might uh, feel more fake or or not real so it's eh? yes absolutely absolutely um Mariam is uh, asking a very interesting question um, about boundaries with people from different culture. Uh, is there a general rule or safe, uh, safe approach working with traumatized war refugees coming from different backgrounds, religions and cultures? So um, as I go into prisons, obviously I come across people from different backgrounds, religions and cultures. And I think the very plain um, Re, um, rule of respecting self and respecting others is um, the first is the only, is, 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 is the way that the basis of all human connections and I can tell you Marianne that um, in um, the training this uh, this past weekend we had some some real diff hard conversations about race and privilege and within that the most important thing is was to listen and to uh, allow people to feel safe to share and it did become quite difficult it because language i, I think language is very tricky um and and also that sometimes unresolved personal trauma goes into cultural feelings, goes into feelings of, um, you know, of, of, of feeling oppressed, feeling oppressed and saying becoming an activist in um, a certain area of like say, I come from this oppressed group, I'm a woman, I come from an oppressed group, so now, I'm going to fight for women, say, and I am extremely angry at men. So this is a very plain example, but I used to be really angry at men anyway. And um, I wasn't particularly a feminist activist, but my anger at men came directly from my unresolved trauma. Mm -hmm. And if that would have been channeled into my feelings towards men in general, uh, and sometimes it was, you know, sometimes I would make fun of men, especially. I would make fun of men or I would certain, in certain um, interpersonal uh, interactions, I would, would make men feel bad. And that came from my own unresolved trauma. Mm -hmm. So, um it's important just to be aware of all of that that when is someone speaking uh, a truth that needs to be heard when is someone um adding their own unresolved trauma to those feelings and and, and amplifying them and, and and making them more intense um and when is someone Taking their difficult circumstances, their difficult circumstances based on um, oppression, and using them in a spiritual sense to completely, well, we use the word accept, which was a very difficult word, but to accept all physical circumstances in order to move forward from there. And that word acceptance was one <clears throat> that we realized in the group. <coughs> Excuse me, that one person perceived the word acceptance as <coughs> passively accepting. <coughs> Excuse me. And 
<coughs> sorry, what was really meant by it was um, to be aware. <coughs> okay, no. take, take, yeah. I, will, I will take over for a moment. Take, uh, take over. The, um, what I find also interesting uh, about this uh, theme of uh, different uh, races is that in, in my work, in my experiences, I've been working um, in Rwanda with the uh, genocide survivors. Um, and then within those groups, there was also domestic violence and there were different groups also there. So very complex trauma, trauma uh, people. And um, very often people also, um, they're speaking, they're, they're they're maybe not allowed to speak the truth. So sometimes it's very, it becomes a very complex uh, thing. Also, in, uh, I was in Lesbos last year working with uh, refugees. Um, also, when I see refugees in, uh, in, in my work in the Netherlands, like I, I meet all different kinds of people. Very often people, um, they had to lie uh, in their life to, to, to be in a certain place uh, on earth, uh, like to, to go to a different country or to get the help uh, that, they, that they need. And sometimes it becomes a very complex kind of dynamic where people, like I've even seen people becoming really psychotic because of this, because of the traumas and, and, um, and really don't know what was the truth anymore or what was uh, uh, the reality or maybe the parents were hiding things. Um, now I'm, for example, now I see one client and she is from Morocco, but she was uh, smuggled into the Netherlands and she does not know anything about the first three months of her life. And her mother, she, when she's asking her mother, the mother is hesitant to say something. So it feels like she knows more, but she doesn't dare to say. And it's such a complex, uh, complex story. And, well, of course, all these this complexity you take in with uh, if you, if you if you use uh, the yogic terms in your samskaras, it becomes a very complex um, uh, pl complex story, of course. Um, and yeah, and then there's the boundaries, and then there's the, the reality, like wh where am I, and what is true, and what do I want to share? What kind of kind of permission do I give you? And finding, uh, finding like where you can, where you could connect somewhere can be very challenging. And in my, uh, in my opinion, in my experience, it is always back to, okay, being real. Like, okay, where, who are you? What do you allow to say? Or what do you, uh, what can you say or how far can you open up and accept the person where he is in his process? Whatever, we never know the complete complexity. Even if we're asking people and they trust you, maybe they say something or they, they allow us to go somewhere, maybe in, in yoga or whatever, therapeutic intervention. We never know if this is the whole story. So I think always be mindful where you are and. And I'm always very grateful for people, how much they, they, they just open. And I never want to push people to open more or anything like this. This is the situation where we are. This is the story, how it is, how a person wants to, decides to share it in this moment. This is the truth. I'm not going to battle about uh, maybe you're lying, maybe it's not the truth. This is the truth. This, this is what it is. And then... I need to feel like how does this meet my truth and my boundary and and somewhere you will meet each other somewhere you meet each other and maybe the distance is far maybe the distance is closer maybe this is changing but yes, and and, and um, something that I, I I really learned about um, ourselves about liberation this weekend that um, hadn't been verbalized before but someone said it specifically was that um they they had taken another trauma training and they said that they felt a little strange because they felt that everything everyone with trauma was treated as though they were a fragile leaf mm. and they found it refreshing to be um with us because that's not how you know we say things as they are so we don't um 
we don't try to um, make things better or we don't try to uh, cover things over. But at the same time, there's a recognition that difficult circumstances and, and, and trauma uh, do a lot to strengthen a person and that there's t- tons of resilience so that if you could see that first in a person who has been traumatized, um, that is a much, much better place to start than, um, you know, looking at someone as, you know, obviously you don't, we don't want to look at anyone as broken, but uh, yes. So. Or weak, yeah. I think people are not weak, but super strong, like super strong to survive certain circumstances. And I don't know uh, uh, the, the English word, but in, in Dutch we would say the tuttelen. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, I don't know how you say that, but it would be something like to make small, to make to to, yeah. to, to talk to somebody like they're a little baby. So yeah, just just uh, pretend as if somebody is a child or a baby, and you know you need to you need to do, to see person for yeah for the adult who he is. But this this is also what you hear very often that people are. Um, and, and at the same time, I can say that pe- uh, the the two people, well. I'll speak about one particularly. There was someone who took my training and uh, participated the whole time and then afterwards had a reaction and it turned out that, you know, and, and, and then, you know, wrote, a, wrote to the studio that was hosting uh, the training and wanted a refund and, so, and, and said that I had overshared and that it was irresponsible of me to share what I had shared, um, that it was not careful. And... And, and I should say that this, so I remember the person, I liked her fine, and, and I, I did notice that she seemed fragile. So it was someone who looked fragile, looked very, um, sort of looked a little bit like a scared little girl, and was also extremely little, and was also very privileged. And in this uh, instance, I believe, <clears throat> and very often this is the case, that that privilege uh, doesn't help someone to really go deep and, and, and be faced with their trauma because the privilege will always act as a cushion that will um, keep you floating without ever to really having to, to face um, what really happened to you and, and, and be confronted with that stark reality. And, so, um, so boundaries with someone like that is if someone is not happy at the training, um, you know, full refund, you know, there's no question. If you were not happy at the training, that is, um, I'm not going to get into any argument. I'm not going to try to be right. This is absolutely, I ap- would apologize, uh, that that was their experience and just, you know, uh, uh, get, just, just, just try to res- restore, in, you know, to the degree possible um, <clears throat> that they're not left with even maybe more bad feeling. Mm-hmm. So um, I wanted to thought briefly mention permission because well, most of you work in, 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 in wellness, but um, Annika and I were uh, discussing before, and so there were a few things that maybe um, you want to bring out, or uh, maybe someone has another specific issue or a specific question or a specific issue they want um, help with. But the three words, safety, boundaries, and permission, no, there is a difference between the three of them. and. Um, it has happened, for example, that in my training, people have suddenly felt unsafe. And, you know, that is, you know, as much as we try, we can never create a fully safe space. Um, there's a, there is a, um, there are attempts to change that vocabulary a little bit right now in the trauma world and to create a safer space rather than a safe space because we can never promise safety in the physical world. Um, we don't know what's going to happen uh, in, a, in a second, in a minute. And uh, certainly I found also in the jails and the prisons that we cannot really promise that the mat is going to be a safe space, for example. 
because a CEO could be walking in and stand on the person's mat and tell them to get up and give them their number. And that has happened. So um, <clears throat> save for space. Yes, thank you, Christine. And um, um, so feeling safe is obviously something that comes from within. And we don't really have control over that. You know, we can do what we can with um, setting clear boundaries, with creating safety guidelines for the weekend, uh, co-creating them uh, potentially mm -hmm. to um, allow everyone to say what helps them to feel safer, uh, to, to create um, an environment where people are going to feel internally safe to say things. And I feel that the hard conversation that we had this weekend um, was made possible because people felt that safe to speak. And so they said things that to some other people may have sounded pretty harsh, but we were able to come together afterwards because there was a, um, because, because people had felt safe enough to speak and others had felt um, uh, were, were gracious enough to really want to listen and really be quiet and listen. Hmm. And and somebody is uh, is there to hold that space. I think this this is this is also like um, like important that that you can really be like a thermometer, you know, to feel because it's also this safer space. It's not like uh, you close the curtains and and for now it's a more safer space because it can it can change during the the moment also in the moment. It, like like you said, it can change. So it's like a constantly feeling and tuning in like how how is this how is this how how close can i get like not not, not literally but in um, and then also um i think it's also it's very good i think that the world is becoming more aware of safer spaces um but also i think the 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 the, the challenge there could also be that that it's the safe the same things are safe for everybody um, because it doesn't mean if 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 you got there was a, a bad experience with a man that every man is unsafe and that every woman is safe or something like this or it's also not true that every touch is uh, unsafe and um things like this and i've seen this uh in my experience in in my work that sometimes the opposite can be true but i know that um, I always st st have this starting point. Like I have my, my ways to make this a safer space or what I'm trying to do. Like for example, when I'm teaching yoga, I'm teaching in a circle. Like some people have different opinion about it, but I'm teaching in a circle so that everybody can see everybody. I'm not walking, walking around, I'm staying on my mat. I never give physical adjustments, blah, 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 all these things. And, uh, and in some cases, the, um, the, there was an experience of a woman who said, I, I wanted to feel a touch, you know, or that you, 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 there's always exceptions and, but you don't know. So I think it's very important to, to keep it, keep it safe, uh, in the, in the first, in, in the first place there, there's also an example of, um, this, I find an, a very interesting example. Also this, this woman who has a, a problem with men because of uh, a lot of experiences. And uh, she sometimes needed to go out of the city and into the woods to be just by herself because all the, the, the input of the city and everything is too much and she really needs to be by herself. And she was telling me that she went there all by herself and she takes her hammock, she sleeps there, she camps there and in the, in the middle of nowhere. And what happened was that there was the last thing that she was, um, wishing for was a man to appear in that place for her which was her safe spot at the moment um, and it happened anyway and then she had this opportunity to 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 connect with this man and i think this was um for her a a very big uh leap in her development that she found a way to to conquer that like she could allow this to happen she felt like she had the because what was interesting, she said the men started to talk with her and uh, talking about also uh, boundaries and um, um, uh, in a kind of hierarchical way. 
um, because the man, he said to her, well, I'm from Amsterdam, uh, we are from Amsterdam, I'm from the south of Amsterdam, which is a little bit fancy. And he said, I'm here now in the middle of nowhere and I forgot my whatever food, so I don't know what to eat. And she said, well, I'm going to eat stuff from the woods. She's kind of a hippie girl. She knows what she can eat. And he was asking her, okay, can you help me? And she felt like in this moment, like she could, she was the one who, um, who could like give advice to this man. He was asking her, there was a lot of interesting dynamics going on there. And to reflect on this with her was very healing. Like this, this whole event turned out that she was really learning like how to, how to work, uh, work with her feelings in like what would look like the most uh, unsafe situation for her. But she found a way to create, she found a way to create a situation that was actually uh, uh, very healing for her in that moment. And um, yeah, so, so to, to be always very mindful, um, uh, uh, yeah, like, like everybody is different, everybody's story is different, and yeah, you can, you can never, uh, like, um, um, how do you say this in English? Like, yeah, just to always connect to a personal experience instead of seeing yeah. people as the uh, survivor. You know what I mean, Annika? Absolutely. And it's a great uh, example of permission, actually, of using permission, of be be becoming, uh, feeling safe enough to use permission. The man asked for permission. And I think it's a beautiful example yeah. of um, yeah. her being empowered by uh, being asked for permission and then being able to give it. Uh, yes or no, you know, was her mm -hmm. choice. And I just want to um, respond to Marianne here uh, with the Bessel van der Kolk uh, saying, uh, speaking about resonance, so we can, okay, so I, I think Marianne, what that really speaks to, and, you know, I've met Bessel van der Kolk, and so um, I found that sometimes Bessel van der Kolk's um, own trauma because of whatever, uh, you know, position and status he received in the trauma world became uh, kind of it became kind of solipsistic and became a little bit self-involved in that uh so when when he speaks about resonating with the trauma of his patients and then at the same time writing about those patients uh, without giving those people a name and without allowing those people to speak for themselves it creates again there's a power dynamic there that um um, he was fired uh, from the trauma center uh, for being rude to um, people below him. And I think that that, that, that that doesn't surprise me, let's say, because I've met him. And I just want to say that the issue, though, of resonating with trauma from your own space of trauma uh, is simply empathy. And um, it's the way for the new paradigm. Um, you would be better suited to help someone if you had gone through this journey of healing and you were really truly able to understand that person. And the more similar your um, history and the greater your healing, the more you'd be specialized, let's say, in helping, really being able to help that other person um so the resonance and where that it get can get confusing is that people feel that when they work in this way when they when they when they are on the same level as another person and they work from the heart and they work from their own experience and resonate with the trauma of the other person because they've been there themselves and they've had the healing and they are able to share that healing which is really this this whole new model, uh, the empathic model, the, that, that, that leads to an egalitarianism, really, uh, instead of speaking down to someone. If you speak down to someone, it, it actually means you have not had the experience to know, to really know, mm -hmm. and you're pretending to know. This is why you need the status to seem bigger than you really are. So to resonate with people, it's really healthy. And what people are sometimes confused about is when they start to work in this model is how good that actually feels. Because when you connect from the heart with somebody else, you have a, 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 
an energy exchange that is extremely beautiful mm. and you receive you feel like you're receiving so much oh my god why why am i feeling so good you know you're not going to suffer from burnout if you work this way no. uh, you're going to feel incredible you may be really really tired because there may have been a lot of work a lot of deep work may have been done but at the same time, you feel just so amazing that you sometimes wonder, am I supposed to feel this good? And I hope, I, I hope that's the experience. And that's why you have that question about resonating with your own trauma. Well, Annika, I would like to uh, say something about that because I totally agree with you. And I feel like after also 20 years working in psychiatry and um, just having so many like ex like practices and experiences and i felt like i feel like i i really can allow myself to to have these experiences and on the other hand it becomes very difficult sometimes to work in the systems the healthcare systems as they are because people are my colleagues i mean they are looking at me and they very often they told me you'll get a burnout you get too close so when I feel like I'm entering a zone where healing can really happen, I notice my boundaries. It's a very transparent relationship. It's very healthy. And there is a very much uh, like healing and work done. And it's a very slow process. It's a, it needs a long breath and a lot of patience um, and, and, and a lot of yourself, like you said. But it's really, it's really very very nice for yourself and the person the work becomes but then you enter another uh, stage of the difficulties and the uh, and the boundaries of the organization yes. and the society and my colleagues and my team because Which for some reason I don't we really are the exact opposite model yeah it's 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 difficult it's really yeah, I find it yeah. very difficult to fine tune this and uh, work in, in a holistic way, yeah. in a, um, well, Western a vertical, a vertical, a vertical structure, really. Yes. So to be, to work in a, in a horizontal way, in a vertical structure. Yeah. Because and what I to, see, but don't understand you. Yeah. And you have to be careful. Yeah. Because people don't understand you, you're going to get better results too. So you have to be careful. Yeah. Which is kind of, uh, could be kind of traumatizing in itself. Because it, it's not the first time that I feel that, uh, that people are uh, unnice, unnice. Jealous. jealous. And, and I should say, we have only five minutes left, but I should say that this is a very big conversation, obviously. And there are, you know, when you start working in this way, that, which really does change the paradigm of the way things are. It really does. Mm -hmm. on the, it's it's a very small action but it is the only thing that truly matters mm -hmm. is when you're working directly with people i've uh, done advocacy to change laws and as i become involved in that i realize that it's pretty much all bs and that the that the system the vertical system is all bs it's all about status and um hiding trauma it's trauma based so trauma is oppressed and, and, and awareness of trauma remains oppressed mm -hmm. and this is a very large conversation because breaking out of that vertical paradigm that yes. is trauma based and where trauma is suppressed requires at this point especially a whole lot of courage and it is extremely difficult to navigate the waters because yes. a lot of people who have the courage have real prices to pay when you first leave this uh, vertical system. So mm -hmm. we, uh, often people are called whistleblowers. You know, whistleblowers have a real price to play. pay. Some get killed. Um, others are navigating these very dangerous waters with, with having information, but revealing that information, which may be necessary to change the situation, is very tricky and puts them in harm's way. And um, so I just want to acknowledge that anybody who is trying to work within this system, it requires so much courage and it is so um, 
you know, I, I meet so many amazing people who are navigating this very complex uh, way of mm. creating change. And this, nav this navigation is certainly part of the book that I am writing because definitely I'm writing all this stuff down and it, it is working, but it just needs a lot of patience uh, to do this work. And also the, I'm, uh, I want to offer some space in my book for the client perspective. So my clients, I want to have their voice also in there, how they see it and how we can help each other. So, and there, because there, yeah, like you said, there's uh, so many, and now actually we're triggering a few subjects that, I am very interested in to discuss maybe in another webinar in another time in the workshop with us in Amsterdam. And this is uh, jealousy of people uh, who see that the relationship with their colleague and the client is better. And there's a lot of uh, projection and kind of uh, interesting dynamics also there. And uh, it's, it's really interesting to, to dive a little bit deeper in that. But like you said, it's really almost time. Um, so we need to go to an ending and um, I'd just like I to say that in the in the horizontal system that boundaries safety boundaries and uh, permission are more organic mm -hmm. they come from within from your own inner sense of um, of, of, of permission and and, and uh, self-esteem and that in the vertical system they are more imposed but um, I will just say before we leave that Sometimes setting a boundary, when you realize that something is not really working well in your life and setting a boundary, whether it's professional or personal, is something that you need to do. It may feel like faking it, but then setting the boundary helps create that change, the inner change that you're actually sure. seeking because yeah. it reveals everything that was hiding behind you not being able to set that boundary in the first place. It's necessary to be compassionate, to be this compassionate human you, and to, to be compassionate, connecting. You have to set your boundaries. So all the work is within. And um, well, I think this is a great way of, of ending this conversation. And we will uh, continue the conversation about trauma, boundaries, safety, about uh, jealousy under the workers, like all these uh, conversations will continue. Um, um, to keep following uh, Annika Lucas and the books that she's writing when it's coming out, the, the trainings uh, she is doing, and um, and my work, be my own, be your own therapist, and and the compassion-based hatha yoga um, trainings. And together we are uh, we're gonna work uh, on this training in Amsterdam. And I hope that you can uh, can join us because it's really uh, it really works. Uh, when we see each other in person and especially in a couple if, if we have some time I always know when I'm doing a retreat or a workshop which is like more than one day I'm like after it's like mind-blowing what happens after a few days it's it's so so super grateful for these experiences so and yeah this I think for Annika for you and for me both is just our mission on earth to, to <laughs> share whatever we uh, we feel like sharing from our hearts and yes. I hope that if it resonates with you that we can meet you uh, somewhere and um, that we can yeah grow grow together in the, in this development so thank, thank you, you very much Annika and um, thank you very much everybody who was here thank you for being vulnerable asking your questions and keep continuing continue um, in email let us know what you thought of it share it with your friends and um, and hope to see you in person. Thank you, everybody. Thank you very Thank much. You, Monica. <laughs>